Uh, I'm also very grateful for, for the many messages of sympathy from all over the world, from British people, from South Africans. And, and this, this case is not about Syrian and the three accused. It's about my beautiful daughter and me, not forgetting her. And I'm sure she'll be very, very happy today to hear what we got for the, the decision. As a father, I demand justice against whoever involved in this. And I, I wish, I wish I get that justice. I wish Sri a very speedy recovery from his illness so that he can now go to Cape Town and help the police and clear his name as he says. Twenty-eight-year-old Annie Nina Hindocha was born to Vinod and Neelam in Sweden. Her family were originally from Uganda, but they had been forced to leave in the early 1970s, after the country's president Idi Amin gave all Ugandans of South Asian descent 90 days to leave the country. The family were granted residence in Sweden and settled in Maristad, before Annie was born. Annie had two siblings, a sister named Amy and a brother Anish. Annie's father Vinod thrived in Sweden after starting a successful business and the family were very settled. Intelligent, ambitious and confident, Vinod said he knew he spoiled her, but he couldn't help himself. Annie's cousin said she was like the leader of the pack and the glue of the family. After graduating from university, Annie moved to Stockholm to work in marketing for the mobile phone maker Ericsson. As she reached her mid-twenties, she was looking to settle down and hoping to find a husband. She adored her sister's children and was keen to start a family of her own. She regularly flew to London and would spend her time shopping, socialising and making contacts. It wouldn't be long before she met 30-year-old Sri Indawani from Bristol. He was well respected and successful, working in his family's nursing home business and was already a millionaire before the age of 30. One of Annie's aunts had seen him around and thought the match between he and her niece would be perfect. She arranged for the pair to meet at a coffee shop. Annie's sister said that although Annie didn't seem to like him straight away, after the second date she had warmed to him. Shreen had been engaged previously, but the wedding was called off due to what was described as petty family disagreements. Shreen and Annie had very similar lives, with Shreen's parents also fleeing Uganda for the same reason Annie's had. People had differing opinions of Shreen, some said they found him to be quite arrogant, someone that loved to show off his wealth, but others said that beneath all that, he was actually very kind and generous. Annie's sister said that Annie would always talk about how much she liked Shreen's sense of humour and the way he made her feel protected. As the couple entered into a long-distance relationship, taking it in turns to visit each other, they began finding things tough. Friends said they were both very headstrong and often argued, presumably about the distance. At one point, Annie called time on the relationship, but they eventually patched things up with Annie giving up her job in Stockholm and moving into an apartment in Luton so that the couple could be closer. Her parents soon flew over to meet Shreen's family. Vinod recalled feeling a bit intimidated by the wealth of the Diwani family, but said they were very welcoming and warm. Vinod said that everyone had really liked Shreen. He was polite, educated and driven, and the couple seemed to have a great connection. Annie told her dad that Shreen did not believe in sex before marriage, something Vinod said showed dedication to his religion and Annie as his future wife. After the visit was over and both parents had approved of the couple and the families, Annie and Shreen made plans to marry. In October 2010, hundreds of guests gathered just outside of Mumbai to celebrate the three-day wedding of Shreen Dewani and Annie Hindocha. It was a truly exquisite event and Annie had spent three months in India planning it. Vinod said that although his family were not wealthy like the Diwanis, he had been saving for his children's wedding since they were born and wanted to give Annie everything she had dreamed of. As picture perfect as the wedding had seemed, some of Annie's close friends recalled feeling weird about it, with one of her friends saying it didn't feel like Annie was very present and someone else referring to the wedding as a strange experience that didn't feel like the friend she knew. 
The three-day event would soon be over, and Shreen and Annie Dewani would be heading off for their honeymoon. Three weeks after their gorgeous wedding, the couple headed to South Africa on their 10-day honeymoon. Annie had no idea where they were going, and the whole thing had been planned by Shreen. He had told people he chose South Africa because it was an S for Shreen and an A for Annie. After a busy and eventful few days, they arrived at Cape Town International Airport from Johannesburg on Friday, November 12th. Shreen was looking to flag down a taxi. Instead of using the hotel's dedicated car service, he opted for the local shuttle service at a cheaper rate. A driver named Zola Tongo pulled over in a Volkswagen minivan and the couple began the 20-minute drive to their lavish waterfront hotel called Cape Grace. Before Zola dropped the Duanis at their hotel, Shreen asked Tongo to wait for him so he could make plans for him to pick them up the following night for dinner. Shreen said he wanted Tongo to show the couple around Cape Town as well and Tongo agreed to act almost as an unofficial tour guide for the pair. The following day, before the couple were picked up by Tongo, they spent time at the bar having some drinks and taking pictures. Shreen had reserved a table at 96 Winery Road, one of the most acclaimed restaurants in the area. Tongo picked the couple up at about 7.30pm. But on the way to the restaurant, Shreen and Annie decided they weren't in the mood for a big meal and wanted something lighter. Tongo said he knew the right area and would take them there. He pulled off the highway just before 9pm and eventually dropped them off at the Surfside restaurant in Strand. They stayed for only a short time before Tongo picked them up at around 10.30pm. Shreen said Annie was keen to see the raw and real culture of some parts of South Africa, especially the nightlife of the townships. He said she insisted that Tongo drive around and show them what it was like. The three drove into the township of Gugaletu. To this day, Gugaletu has an extremely high crime rate, and people that live there say it's rare to ever leave your homes after dark, let alone have tourists that visit. Over 700 people were murdered in Gugaletu between 2005 and 2010, which amounts to one murder every two and a half days, for five consecutive years. The police said they themselves wouldn't even travel into some of the townships without being in a big group. At 10.45, Tongo stopped the car at an intersection, and out of nowhere, two men rushed the vehicle and started banging on the windows holding guns. The men got into the car, eventually forcing Tongo out. They began driving around for almost an hour, with the couple holding each other in the back seat, terrified. They took Shreen's watch and phone and Annie's jewellery. Eventually, the car stopped. The man who was driving said they didn't want to hurt the couple, and they would let them go, but separately. Shreen was then thrown out onto the road, and the gun-wielding men sped off into the night with a hysterical Annie in the back seat. At 10.30pm, a man opened his door to find Shreen standing in front of him, crying and asking if there was anywhere near he could report a carjacking. He had been stumbling up and down the road, knocking on doors, moving from one home to the next in the dark. The man said he asked him for details, but Shreen was hazy and too distraught to remember a lot. The police arrived shortly after and took Shreen back to the location it had happened in, driving around trying to piece everything together. They also quickly located the taxi driver Zola Tongo, who had reported the carjacking as well, and everyone headed back to the Cape Grace Hotel together. The hotel manager spoke with both Shreen and Tongo. He commented how odd it was to be staying in a hotel as glamorous as the Cape Grace, on your honeymoon, and be wanting to travel through dangerous townships like Google Atu in the middle of the night. Shortly after, Vinod got a call off Prakash Dewani back in Bristol saying that Annie had been kidnapped. Vinod was confident they could pay the kidnappers whatever they wanted and save his daughter. After this, he would then answer the phone again, this time to Shreen, telling him how sorry he was he was unable to protect Annie. Vinod booked the first flight out. 
Early the following morning, police received a call from a resident living in a neighbourhood in Kailicha, about a 20-minute drive from Gugulatu. They reported that a grey Volkswagen minivan had been sitting alongside the road all night. At 8am, the police got to the vehicle. Lying across the back seat was the body of Annie Dewani. She had been shot once at point-blank range in the neck, and the bullet was lodged in the seat. She had some bruises on her body, and the coroner confirmed that she would have bled to death. Tragically, her father would hear of this as he was boarding his connecting flight from Amsterdam. He said he spent the journey feeling totally numb. He met Shri on the following day at the Cape Grace Hotel. One of the officers that arrived at the scene that morning said he knew right away this would not be a straightforward case. Something felt strange and didn't sit right with him. He said that Tongo would have known the area well, well enough to know the dangers at least and probably enough that he would have most likely been able to identify the two men. You wouldn't drive tourists around there during the day, let alone at night, so why did you? the officers asked. She insisted, Tongo said. But Annie's sister said she simply didn't believe Annie would have wanted to do that, and was well aware of the potential dangers they could face. The officer questioning Tongo wondered why the men let both he and Shrian leave alive and unharmed, knowing they would likely go straight to the police and identify them. And then they proceed with Annie by herself, and she gets shot. That, to me, just doesn't gel, he recalled. The murder of Annie Dewani was shocking, and the residents of Cape Town and South Africa as a whole said despite the crime rate, this was still an appalling and awful case by anyone's standards. Annie's story took up vast amounts of space in the news and had immense media coverage from all over the world. A honeymoon for a British couple has ended in tragedy just hours after their holiday began in Cape Town. This morning, the body of a 28-year-old woman was found in a car in Kailicha. She and... The 28-year-old woman was travelling with her. Authorities threw a huge amount of time and resources at the case, keen to solve something that had become such big news so quickly. Zola Tongo was initially very helpful with police and was keen to answer their questions. The case was moving at a rapid pace and the two men that had hijacked the vehicle were quickly located. Prince found in and on the car took police straight to a man named Golil Mengeni. He had been arrested several years earlier, and his prince had remained on file. He was apprehended in his home, and while police were searching around, they found a phone that had been wedged in between the mattress and the bed frame. When they asked who this belonged to, Mengeni said it belonged to the taxi driver, Zola Tongo. Mengeni confessed to his involvement almost immediately, he told police that the third man they were looking for was 26-year-old Zwamadoda Kwabe. Kwabe was found two days later, and by this time, Shrian had already flown back to the UK. While Kwabe was being questioned, he threw a third and new name into the mix, Mondo Mbolombo, a receptionist at another hotel. As Kwabe was leaving one of his interviews, Mondo was being brought in. As he passed him, Kwabe asked police if he could speak to him, but that he would say it in English. He said, tell them everything. Police would soon make another announcement. The 31-year-old taxi driver who had been so helpful and forthcoming with detectives had also been arrested in connection with the murder of Annie Dewani. Zola Tongo's friends said it came as a total shock to them. He had no criminal record and had always been so responsible and law-abiding they said something like this was hard to believe. But Shrian told a reporter he had actually suspected that Tongo was involved, so the arrest didn't come as a complete shock. As the media firestorm raged on, Annie was finally laid to rest. 1,500 people would gather in a concert hall in London for Annie's memorial service, and her ashes would later be scattered in her favourite area of the Van Ern Lake 
which was close to her hometown in Sweden. The police's investigation continued, and to their surprise, Zola Tonga would make a claim so strong and startling that it would turn the investigation completely on its head. Tongo was escorted into Winberg Magistrates Court, his face hidden by a sheet. It had been announced that he was likely to enter a plea bargain and receive a more lenient sentence in exchange for more information about the case. Tongo claimed that this was no random attack, and he wanted to tell the whole truth about what had really happened that night. He alleged that it had in fact been Annie's husband Shrian that had orchestrated the entire crime and put together the plan to kill his new bride. He said that the day he picked Shrian and Annie up from the airport, Shrian hung back to talk to him while Annie went inside. According to the CCTV, Shrian spent almost 10 minutes talking to Tonga in the car. What Shrian allegedly said was that he wanted someone taken off the scene. Tonga said to Shrian that he was not the man for the job, but that he knew someone that could facilitate his request. He said that Shrian offered 15,000 rand, the equivalent of less than 1,000 pounds at the time, to carry out the alleged hit. The police said that Tongo's claims appeared to be backed up by the copious amounts of CCTV footage, but others said that the CCTV backed up Shrian's side of the story and version of events too. Tongo said that after he drove away, he headed to the hotel that Monde worked at. And it was here that Monde contacted Kwabe, and the plan was set in motion. Phone records showed Monde repeatedly trying to get hold of Kwabe and Tongo. The CCTV in the hotel Monde worked at had audio as well, and during one of the calls he said, It's that thing we were talking about. It must happen today. See the scope like that. I may not have a Tongo said that he had met Shrian just before noon on the day of the murder, so that Shrian could get his money converted. Tongo drove him to the place with a lower conversion rate than the hotel. Vinod said he rang to get hold of Annie, but Shrian answered the phone, and said he was in fact at the market changing some money over. Vinod thought nothing of it, and just asked that she call him back later. Tongo professed that Shrian took him aside outside the Surfside restaurant on the night of the murder and wanted to know if he had arranged for the guys. Tongo confirmed that everything had been arranged. As they began to drive into Gugula 2, Tongo said that he and Shrian exchanged several text messages. It was alleged that Shrian had told him the cash was in an envelope in a pouch behind the front seat. Police said that the texts and calls between the pair were corroborated by cell phone data analysis, but because Shrian's phone was never located, the contents of the messages will probably never be known. It was a media frenzy and nobody knew what to think. If this plea deal was to go ahead, it meant that Annie's family had to be consulted and they were faced with a difficult and gut-wrenching decision. But her family all ultimately agreed for Tongo to accept it and as confused and devastated as they were, they said they just wanted the truth about what had happened to Annie. The amount of public attention that Annie's case was getting was even more clear to see when the court cases started. The story was huge and getting more surreal by the day. Shrian and his family vehemently denied all the claims, saying it was completely ridiculous and lacked any evidence at all. Shrian's lawyers, two of the most powerful and successful in the country, said that it just seemed incomprehensible that he would have asked the first person he met in Cape Town to carry out a hit on his wife and it just made no sense for the state to be suggesting it. They said the evidence didn't actually prove anything. A little over a month after Annie had been killed, Zola Tongo was jailed for 18 years after making a plea agreement. Monday and Kwabe soon followed suit. 
and would both start pointing the finger at Sri and Dewani too. Kwabe would also be offered a reduced sentence which he would accept in exchange for a guilty plea and his promise of a testimony against Shrian and any other criminal proceedings related to the crime. He was subsequently jailed for 25 years. Mengeni was not offered any kind of deal and he would later plead not guilty in court. Authorities said there was no point in offering him a plea deal because he couldn't have taken them any further with the case than anyone else involved. Mengeni had his trial pushed back as he underwent surgery for a brain tumour, but he was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It is difficult to imagine the absolute terror and horror that she must have endured when she stared down the barrel of the gun. Although from a relatively poor background, did not commit this offence due to poverty or his dire socio-economic circumstances. This crime was perpetrated out of pure greed. It was very difficult to digest that. But at the same time, one glimpse of happiness was that he never said at any point that my daughter was abused. And that was something we really can live on. The full picture will only immerse when Shreen comes down to Cape Town. Lawyers for both Kwabe and Mengeni said their clients had been abused, even tortured by the police, because authorities were so pressured to solve such a high-profile case. The police denied all the allegations. Hotel receptionist Monde admitted to his involvement, but he was granted full immunity from prosecution in exchange for his promise of a truthful testimony against Shrian, something which left many shocked, considering he had been the one to make the call to Kwabe and arrange the hit. Monde said, I want to state it here that Mr. Dewani is lying. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. Shreen would soon find himself arrested in Bristol on suspicion of conspiring to murder Annie, and South African authorities were now fighting to extradite him. But despite what the men were saying, there still didn't appear to be any motive. People said he wouldn't have gained anything from Annie's death financially as there was no life insurance policy, and by all accounts there didn't appear to be any issues within the couple's relationship. But an interview with the Sun newspaper was later published, which gave the South African police a potential motive if Shrian was involved. Anonymous emails have been sent to the Sun suggesting that Shrian was gay, and people alleged that he had been paying a male prostitute for sex. His name was Leopold Laser, and was known to his clients as the German master. Leopold told the Sun that Shrian had confided in him that he was in a relationship that he needed to get out of. Shrian and his family had maintained that this was all nonsense, and said that he was blissfully happy with his new bride. I just married the girl of my dreams, he said. Why would I want to kill her? But police began speculating that perhaps Annie had found out during the honeymoon that Shrian was keeping this potential secret about his sexuality, and this is what sparked the later events. One of the leading investigators said it had become the most publicised, most in-your-face case he'd seen in his 36 years on the job. Although Vinod fiercely fought back against anyone that suggested his son-in-law may have been involved, he later revealed that over time, things had began to eat away at him more and more. I have spoken with my son-in-law, and there are far more questions than answers, he said. Many South African reporters and journalists agreed, and said that although the crime rate in the area was high, something just didn't add up. One reporter said that this was not a typical crime, far from it, and a big red flag had been that the car was just left there, rather than being burnt or sold on. Vinod said Shrian would often give varying accounts of what happened that night, different times and different orders of events. One example being that Shrian had told authorities Kwabe and Mengeni had taken all of Annie's jewellery, but after Annie was found, he phoned an officer to ask him to check his seam in the back seat of the car. He said he would find Annie's £25,000 engagement ring in there, and sure enough, there it was. When he was asked why this wasn't in his original statement, Shrian said he was in shock at the time, and now he wanted to amend the statement he had made. 
Shreen had also thrown a pizza party the night before Annie's funeral, which Vinod said he found to be highly inappropriate and disrespectful. Annie's family recalled that Shreen was furious that they had gathered to say goodbye to Annie before she was laid to rest, and was very rough with her body when trying to dress her, something Annie's cousin said made her extremely uncomfortable. Her cousin also said that the letters and flowers the family had left with Annie's body ended up on the floor when Shreen grabbed them and threw them down. Shreen later apologised to the family and admitted he shouldn't have acted in that way. The Diwani family hired Max Clifford to handle the overwhelming amount of attention from the press. Max Clifford was a well-known London press agent who had represented celebrities such as Muhammad Ali, Marvin Gaye and Marlon Brando. Once well-respected and sought after in the world of PR, he had a huge fall from grace in 2014. He was sentenced to eight years in prison after being found guilty of a string of indecent assaults against young girls. He would later die in prison after suffering a heart attack. While he was handling Shreen's case, Shreen's brother Prayan demanded that Annie's family sign an agreement that said they would not say anything to the media without consulting Max Clifford first. Vinod refused. Shreen was sent to the Priory Hospital in Bristol and was said to be suffering from depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Max Clifford said that Shreen had lost £28 since his wife's death and was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Shortly after, he was detained under the Mental Health Act. I was speaking to Annie Devani's family who live in Sweden, but they feel that the four people who are in the car, apart from, that is, Annie, uh, all have uh, questions to answer. Now, three of them have been found guilty by the South African courts. They now want Shreyan Devani to turn up. Uh, he is, of course, facing, uh, uh, fighting a legal battle against being extradited from Britain to South Africa. His psychiatrists say he's too ill to stand trial at the moment. He says he's suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome and depression following the death of his new bride. Uh, and also he feels he won't get a, a fair trial here in South Africa. But Annie Devani's family uh, are absolutely insistent he will get a fair trial. They say they just want to hear the truth. And they've urged Trian Devani to give up the fight and to allow himself to be extradited to face trial and answer some questions here in South Africa. The extradition hearing of Shreen Diwani, wanted in South Africa for questioning about the murder of his wife, has heard claims and counterclaims over how he'll be treated in prison if he is returned there. I had a family once upon a time, six months ago, which was different than what I have today. Why? For the past three days, the Hindocha family, who've travelled from Sweden, have sat through an extradition hearing at Woolwich Crown Court. The South African authorities want Shreen Devani, Annie's new husband, to stand trial over the alleged contract killing of his bride in a Cape Town township last November. Much of the extradition hearing is centred on whether South African jails are dangerous, brutal places, on whether Shreen Devani would survive if he was sent there. And as far as the Hindocha family is concerned, this hearing should not be happening at all. If he says he's not, he has, he's not involved in anything, he should proudly go, proudly go to South Africa and say, I didn't do it, here I am, give me just, give me a trial. Due to his mental health issues, Shreen's extradition hearings were pushed back and put off for a long time, but they finally began at Belmarsh Magistrates Court in London. Annie's uncle said, We don't understand why Shreen doesn't simply get on a plane and go and tell his side of the story. Annie's brother said, we are just focusing on this case at the moment and it is hard to even start making the grieving process final yet because there are so many questions we need answers to. The Home Secretary and later Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Theresa May, signed an order for Shreen to be extradited to South Africa. I say that we as a family are satisfied with the decision today made by the British justice system. Um, but it's still a long way to the answers that we are looking for and we don't want to forget Annie in this it's for us it's all about Annie it's all about finding out what happened to her um, and we will fight this battle to the end and this battle has just begun for us Shreen entered a plea of not guilty to all five charges brought against him and the trial would be set 
This is the moment that Shireen Diwani, the millionaire businessman based in Bristol, began his involuntary acquaintance with South African justice, four years after being accused of plotting the murder of his newlywed 28-year-old wife Annie on their honeymoon in Cape Town. Shireen pleaded not guilty to the five charges against him, but he also surprised the court. Through his lawyer, he went on to say that he was bisexual, that he'd had encounters with male prostitutes, and he had abnormally low hormone levels, which meant it was unlikely that he could ever have children. The prosecution is expected to argue that the murder was linked to a sham marriage meant to hide Mr. Diwani's true sexual identity. In his defense statement, Shireen Diwani admitted their relationship was turbulent. An email from Shireen to Annie Diwani, written before their wedding, was read out in court. If you really think being with me is not going to make you happy, then this is not right for you. I really hope that that is not what you are saying, but I don't want to feel like I have forced you into something. On the first day of his trial, the court heard more about his sexuality, and in a written statement read out by his lawyers, Shreen said that despite his previous denials, he was actually bisexual. Annie's family spoke of their disappointment of not knowing this about him, and said they were prepared to sue him for not being honest with them. A list of omissions released by the courts also showed that Shreen had been looking at gay porn and dating websites on the honeymoon and just hours after Annie's body was found. The prosecution said that this, combined with the statements from the German master Leopold and several others, clearly showed that Shreen was conflicted and desperate to hide a big part of his life. They argued that this wasn't about his sexuality per se, rather it was about the conversations in which he had disclosed his desire to get out of the marriage. Diwani tried hard to fight back his tears, but broke down in the dark as this footage was shown. His lawyer, Francia van Sale, says this show of affection contradicts the state's allegation that Diwani plotted his wife's murder. Hendricks hit back, saying Diwani's intentions may seem what he calls nice to the naked eye. But he says Diwani withheld crucial information, including telephonic communication with shuttle driver Zola Tongo on that evening. He says this adds something sinister to Diwani's version. Judge Jeanette Traverso listened to both sides and ultimately ruled that the evidence about Shreen's sexuality was inadmissible. More witnesses came forward on behalf of the prosecution and said that Shreen and Annie's relationship, no matter how perfect it might have looked, was far from it. Annie's cousin recalled that Annie had spoken to her just after the wedding and expressed her worry about whether a big mistake had been made in marrying him. Annie sent numerous text messages to her cousins saying things like, hate him, and fighting a lot with Shreyan, told him I'm going home, wish I had never got engaged. A particularly sad one read, crying has become my new hobby. Just one day into the honeymoon, Annie sent another message saying, really trying, he's a really good guy in all ways, but I don't feel happy with him at all. Others said any disagreements the pair had were totally normal and very trivial, and it's possible the stress of planning such a big wedding had left Annie tired and feeling more emotional. The state's star witness was Zola Tongo, and police and prosecution said that the entire case rested on his testimony. He was the only person that could testify to the alleged conspiracy, having been the only one to speak with Shreyan. A lot of CCTV footage was shown to the court. One clip showed Tongo and Shreyan talking in the hotel lobby, just a day after Annie was killed. One of the cleaners could be seen in the frame as well. Shreyan talks to the cleaner for a second, and Tongo said that this conversation was Shreyan asking him to give the person privacy. After the cleaner leaves, Shreyan allegedly asked Tongo if the job had been done. Tongo said he warned Shreyan that there was a camera right above them. Shreyan looks up and stares at the camera for a second before looking away. Shreyan said that this was a totally innocent conversation. More footage was played out. It showed Shreyan and Tongo meeting in the hotel again. Shreyan, who had been sat with Vinod in one of the rooms, can be seen carrying some sort of white envelope or package. Tongo follows him to another room, away from Vinod and other guests, and then leaves with the same package. Shreyan then returns empty-handed, and Tongo leaves the hotel and heads back to his car. The state said they believed this was the money that had been promised for the hit, 
but Shrian's lawyers said that the money was simply for his services as a driver. Some said this made total sense. Others questioned, if this was the case, why did the exchange of money take place in a private area, off camera, and away from Annie's father? Taxi driver and convicted murderer Zola Tongo has branded Shireen Devani as a liar. Tongo concluded his testimony against the British businessman in the Western Cape High Court today. He spent seven days on the witness stand, five of them under gruelling cross-examination. Shireen Devani's version of events leading to the November 2010 murder of his wife Annie has been described as nonsense and lies. Tongo is the man who fingered him as the mastermind behind his wife's murder. Defence counsel Francois Fonsale today continued his barrage of questions. Tongo remained adamant that Devani offered 15,000 rand to have his wife killed. The British businessman has denied all charges against him, including murder. Tongo also described as a lie the defence's assertion that a fellow prisoner would testify that Tongo told him he was advised to frame Devani for the murder. Tongo's version in court and what he had told police in his affidavit in November 2010 also came under fire from the defence. Tongo was initially very confident on the stand, but when it came time for the defence's cross-examination, his version of events started to change. His story was showing more and more contradictions. At one point, he claimed the police must have added things into his statements without him knowing, which was why he was getting confused. Tongo, Monde and Kwabe were all found to have committed perjury when their testimonies showed differing versions and they admitted to not telling the truth in parts of their affidavits. This threw everything about the already confusing case into question once more. One can understand a witness contradicting himself in certain regards or maybe even not saying exactly what he said in his witness statement to the police initially. But if these differences are, are, are serious and are material, then it has a major impact on their uh, reliability and credibility at the end of the day. And the judgment... The defence's case was getting stronger by the day as the state's case and their star witness began to crumble. On the 23rd day of Shrian's trial, his lawyers requested that the judge throw out the case on the basis that they deemed it to be massively flawed. This was all before Shrian had even taken to the stand himself. Four years after the murder of Annie Dewani, Judge Jeanette Traverso gave a statement. She came down hard on the prosecution and criticised their case against Shrian. She said that the statements of the key witnesses were full of contradictions and ordered that Shrian Dewani be found not guilty. In my view, the evidence presented in this case falls far below this threshold. In the circumstances, I make the following order. The application in terms of Section 174 of the Criminal Procedure Act is granted. The accused is found not guilty on this charge, and Mr. Malombo is granted indemnity, is not granted indemnity from prosecution. Court will adjourn. It has not been possible to connect your call. Please try again later. If he's not guilty, then good luck to him. He should be coming home. He should be allowed to come home. But if he has in any way in his mind, I was complicit in this, then he should stay there. What sort of welcome back will he get? I don't know, really. Um, I shouldn't think it's going to be a great one because, you know, it carries a lot of feeling and this was a very, very, very sad and very tragic case. Very sad. Well, it's going to be very tough for the Annie's family, but... He's been found innocent, so, you know, you have to go by what the law states and I believe, the, you know, if he's coming home, it's, it's the right and proper thing. Shrian said, It is the evidence of these proven liars that led to a witch hunt against me and the resulting failure to pursue the truth of what happened that night. Annie's family were devastated. They said they felt they had been let down by the justice system and that Annie had been let down too. 
After Shrian's exoneration, Annie's family asked for the coroner's court in the UK to reopen the inquest into her death, which would compel Shrian to publicly answer questions. Coroner Andrew Walker said there was insufficient cause to start an inquest, and he was prohibited from reaching a conclusion that was inconsistent with the findings of the South African courts. A formal complaint was lodged against Judge Traverso amid allegations of bias, with many feeling that Shrian should have been made to take the stand and give evidence. She would later be cleared of these claims. Mengeni, who was still suffering from a brain tumour, eventually died in prison. Now, in breaking news, convicted honeymoon murderer Khalile Mgeni has died. Mgeni is the only South African to go on trial for the murder of Annie Dwani in Guguletu in 2010. He was 27 years old. During his trial the following year, the court heard that he had a life expectancy of only five years. Correctional services officials said there was nothing more doctors could do for him. Leopold Lacer, the man that had told the papers about his secret relationship with Shrian, was said to have been suffering from tremendous stress due to the court case. Sadly, in 2016, he took his own life. According to news reports, as of 2018, Shrian was still living in the UK with his boyfriend of about 18 months at the time. In 2021, after serving half his sentence, Zola Tongo was up for parole. Annie's father and uncle went to speak with him in prison before his scheduled release. They said they showed him a picture of Annie, and he was emotionless, unaware of who it was. When they explained who she was, he started crying. Both men said that they weren't satisfied that it was genuine emotion, and that he didn't feel remorseful for what he had done, only that he was a very good actor. His parole was then withdrawn a day before his release. The murder of Annie Dewani is a polarising case, and one that continues to haunt her family. Many think that it was a completely random carjacking that either intentionally or unintentionally ended in murder. Everything that happened in between is purely coincidental, and anything seemingly pointing towards Shrian is unjust, unfair and lacks evidence. Some think that it was planned, but by Zola Tongo. When he saw the glamorous couple with their expensive luggage and belongings, he saw an opportunity to kidnap Annie and use her as part of an extortion plan that ended up going horribly wrong but others believe that Shrian masterminded the whole operation and got away with an atrocious crime. Annie's family and friends are still seeking answers and things only get tougher for them the more that time passes. Annie's uncle said, still today we don't know exactly what happened. That brings a lot of uncertainty. Guessing what happened and knowing what happened are two different things. We want to know what happened. The conflicting stories and accounts from so many means the full truth of what happened that night, how it came to be, and what, if any, connection the five men had on that fateful night back in 2010 will likely never be known. <laughs>